everybody. Welcome to today's episode of Programmatic Connect Digital. We've invited Pau Cavetto, lead programmatic trading of Good Game Studios, to share some insights on making mobile games a global success and to talk a little bit about his thoughts on the iOS 14 IDFA update. Sit back and listen in on the captivating discussion with Pau. Hi, I'm April. So I'm the director of sales at EMEA. And as part of our Programmatic Connect digital series, we invite many experts from within the mobile industry to share some of the insights and strategies they have gathered throughout the years. So today we have someone from Good Game Studios. Hi, Pao. Hi, April. True to be here. Thanks for the invite. Um, we would like to know about, you know, some information, like if you could like give us a background about the company. Um, yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, I am Pao. I'm leading the programmatic training team at Good Game Studios. Uh, we are a gaming company based in the north of Germany, in Hamburg. We are mm -hmm. one of the largest gaming developers in Germany. Mm -hmm. And we are part of the Steel From family. It's the Steel From group. It's a holding based in Sweden. And is part of the about 13 studios, and we're just one of them. And we are uh, we are mostly running uh, mid-core and casual titles for okay. both browser and mobile. Mm -hmm. Cool. And so when it comes to now, let's talk about marketing. So what do you consider as a fundamental thing for your for your um for your plan for mobile games? First, um, mobile advertising maybe has its own defined space. The kind of inventory that we that we have, it tends to be other mobile gaming companies, right? And mm -hmm. other publishers. So the first thing I would actually emphasize is the marketing mix that we use. Uh, if we look at how it has evolved in, in, let's say in 2015, around five years ago, we were buying mostly from CPI networks, SDK networks. Mm -hmm. um, which had a high penetration in the mobile market. But then in 2017, more or less, Facebook um, started their own product with the value optimization. Basically, they started to derive device graph, and they were effectively much more, uh, they were super competitive, and most of the budgets then shifted towards Facebook. So I would say the first thing is to understand which one is the marketing mix actually works for your game, if it has to be more into Facebook or more into maybe UAC, or you have to put more into influencers or a top funnel, depends a little bit. And that would be the fundamental question, right? Most of the gaming companies actually go to the duopoly, go to Facebook and Google for most of the big budgets. So that would pretty much be for mo most of them. Apart from the marketing mix, I would then emphasize as well the creative process. I believe right now the creative is one of the top levers that we actually marketers in the gaming industry can actually use. And I would, I believe that implementing the right processing creatives and the right understanding of the audience and what you want to tell them, uh, it's the fundamental part. And that would mean uh, having a good testing scenario, a good team, and and that's fundamental to make it a success. And then apart from that, as we see more and more that the big platforms are being automated, let's say Facebook and Google mostly, I would say that bringing some automation processes in-house could actually be important and could actually elevate your success rate. Cool. And so you talk about like the, the general um, information about the marketing strategy. Um, how about during this time of pandemic, did, did it change from what it was before or is it, you know, like did something change? Yeah. Um, well, we actually, I mean, unfortunately, um, for the world, I mean, for us has been a good time. As you can imagine, the lockdowns have actually uh, benefited uh, app uh, mm -hmm. developers. So for us, we actually saw better KPIs, especially lower CPMs, given that the brand advertisers were actually leaving the market. So we saw lower CPMs, which actually drove um, and higher conversion rates engagement. So that actually drove us much better CPIs, and we saw every single Humpty Dory, right? We actually didn't scale too much because we saw that we actually were getting more users with the same money. So we didn't scale so much, partially also driven because we, the way we run marketing is that we apply lifetime value models to our players, the ones we acquire. And the problem is that those lifetime value models are based on the history that we know from, from the past. And I don't think any model right now with the current situation is able to predict what's gonna happen in the next six to 12 months. Mm -hmm. 
So for that reason, we were a bit more conservative in terms of um, LTDs, uh, given that we didn't actually know if these cohorts will develop like they, like they used to. Be. And I believe that has been uh, the right strategy and it actually paid off and it's working for us. Apart from that, uh, apart from the model risk that we saw, now we are trying to, let's say, retarget those audiences because we did see some retention increases at the beginning, but we, are, but we believe that probably we will lose some of those uses that we acquired during the pandemic. So we will try now to re-engage them somehow. All right. And so now I have a different topic. So this is more a little bit, um, I would say, on-trend topic. So talking about iOS and the current updates. So what are your opinions about it? And um, do you think it's good for DSPs? Yeah, so I'd love to know your insights. Thanks for the question. Yeah, if COVID hasn't been enough to help on um, the iOS IDFA deprecation. Um, in fact, in fact, it has been a surprise to many, right? Um, Google, um, at least on, on browser, they announced it, but um, IDFA is going to give us a couple of months. So at the moment, there's a lot of talking in the industry. You see MMPs mostly coming up with solutions because they want to somehow keep their business running. So they have to come up with solutions. And you see Singular coming with one, Adjust, or, uh, Kochaba. I believe that all these all these so solutions uh, neglect actually the 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 effort of uh, Apple is to actually move to a probabilistic environment. I think they are tired of uh, people getting targeted on their phones constantly. So they want to move to a more probabilistic environment and keep the use of privacy. So right now, these solutions that we're seeing, I believe they will probably not work out and there's no long-term solution right now. We are the tasks, we want to have long-term solutions. We don't want to invest money in a short-term solution that would actually not work in the next six months. So we are still waiting to see what comes out there, but we believe that uh, we'll probably move into a full probabilistic environment where we cannot actually track anymore the users. That uh, obviously has huge implications, uh, specifically into UA and retargeting. Retargeting is pretty much dead unless we come up with a, some sort of contextual solution. UA will move into more a contextual targeting and PMP deals. And regarding the DSPs that you were mentioning, actually the DSPs uh, in the gaming industry, they were in a clear disadvantage. There were some DSPs that had managed to derive device graph and those had been more valuable to us as an advertiser, and those have been getting most of the budget. But a lot of other DSPs that had actually been running on, on contextual ML machine learning techniques with a bit request, those I think in the past they've suffered because compared to the device graph, it was not competitive. But I believe now that the device graphs are out, I, I think that the, um, all these DSPs that they've been running contextual targeting for a while, they now have a shot and they actually have probably a lot of good knowledge in how to contextual tar targeting. So I, although people think that it's a bad time for UA right now with these upcoming changes, I believe that specifically for DSPs, there's a, an opportunity to actually get some budget from Facebook and these guys who we presume performance will decline when their device graphs uh, wear off. Cool. So now I would go a little bit deeper into the topic of UA. So not really the iOS topic, but more just about, you know, campaign strategy uh, questions. So um, how do you plan an effective user acquisition strategy for a mobile game? Like what are the key things to consider and what do you look for a partner? Yeah. Um, so as explained in the DSP, we have, uh, well, I, I, um, I'll explain now is we have these different types of partners that we can actually work with. You no, know, we have the managed partners, we have the sales partners, and we have the bidder. The bidder maybe don't apply really for gaming, so we'll focus more on the sales and managed. The managed and sales, the main differences have been until now, the different tech stack that they have, in meaning that the managed have had a higher access to device graphs, and but the problem is that you couldn't run any campaigns. So the, the fact that we are the tacit we try to go into a self DSP is because we want to gain control of our campaigns. But the problem is that with the, with the manage, you don't get so much control. So uh, you have to find the equilibrium between how much do you actually want to in-house, how much knowledge are you willing to learn? Obviously, we'll, we want to learn as much as possible, but that will take more risks, more costs. So you might just want to look for performance and you might be better off with a managed partner. 
So that's something that you actually have to evaluate in depending on your long-term perspective or no in strategy. But uh, I would say that when you talk to a partner, you try to understand how the tech stack, how the tech stack works, if um, how they actually model the users, uh, how is the the biggest difference between the different partners relies unfortunately on the machine learning on the algorithm. So you mm -hmm. would actually have to find out which kind of algorithm they're using, if the algorithm actually adapts to you, and then once it's quite hard to actually understand if the algorithm is going to be good for you. There are some questions you can find out, but that comes with experience. And the second question would be, do they have more gaming clients? The reason we ask this is because first, if they have more gaming clients, means that their algorithms probably train better towards gaming clients, so towards gaming cam campaigns. They have a better understanding. And secondly, is because we see that in the, in the gaming environment, when we buy traffic, the supply chain is very opaque. We don't know really, although we don't feel the need of a supply path optimization like in browser, we still find sometimes that the supply that we, the supply path that we actually take is quite important. So finding a DSP that actually understands the supply path and can help you navigate um, the different exchanges and different publishers is quite important. And we've seen quite a big difference between different um, DSPs in terms of knowledge of the industry and effectiveness when they're buying. So I would say those would be the bigger challenge. And yeah, as I mentioned, uh, if you would have asked me this five months ago, I would have told you, oh, just look for user device le device graph partners. No, let's try to find those, uh, the ones that model the user level data. But right now with the whole idea of facing changing, I think that question is not so relevant or is relevant right now, but will not be so relevant in the next month. So now you want to understand how are they gonna navigate these next steps with the IDFA? How do they understand supply chain? How is the algorithm? What kind of clients they have? And I would actually focus on that. So talking about UA, so how about when it comes to re-engaging labs or soon to be churn users? Like what is your strategy on that? Or um, like what is the best time to re-engage your user? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the way we divide, um, we are actually trying, um, the way we divide, the, we segment the strategy that we want to derive is basically we have three strategies. We have one will be to to acquire those churn payers, labs labs uh, payers. The other one would be to upsell, to upsell to get active players to spend more, and the other one would be to uh, try to prevent churn rates uh, from the first retention. Right. So we actually focus mostly on the on the first and on the last one, on the churn payers and on the first day seven users. What we want to do if we first focus on the churn payers, we actually want to get them back. So here the main question would be, how much are we willing to bid for these users and where can we find them? Normally we try to find them first in DSPs because it's normally cheaper. And if we're not able to find them, then we'll try to look for them in Facebook and these world, world partners where they might find an IDFA that is not working anymore, but they might find a Facebook ID and they might be able to find them. But mostly we try to do it on DSPs because we believe that's where you got most control and it's the best channel for them. So in that one, the main question would be, how much are we willing to bid for each user? And for that, we will take into account the, the amount of uh, that this person uh, spent in our game, when did they lapse, and how long did they play for? Knowing those three variables, then we can determine a bid or a CPA target that we can afford. And that would be for the change. Whereas for the day seven re retention, what we're trying to do is that in the first seven days, we acquire a whole bunch of users, but unfortunately, we lose a lot of them. We see in the first seven days, we lose a substantial part of them, like uh, a lot. So we're trying to at least get some of those back. And the way we see is that we're trying to hit them. Mm, this is something you actually have to test. When do you want to hit them? Do you want to hit them after the third day, after the fourth day of install, after they have not logged in for two days? Those are things that you have to test and you test them in, with incrementality tests to see if they actually make sense. And uh, yeah, and what we're actually now trying to do is trying to find, for instance, if we see that there's a certain user that is coming from a very expensive lookalike audience from Facebook, where we spend 20 bucks to, to get this, this user, then we will try definitely to, to get those uh, more than someone who came from a cheaper channel where we actually didn't pay that much. Because we actually have a higher uh, risk of losing uh, someone who paid 20 euros for an install than someone who paid five euros. So those would be the strategies that we derive. And right now with this, what we mentioned with the whole COVID, I think it's a good time to do retargeting. And on top of that, with the whole IDFA, I think we don't have much time. At this point. So we're actually pushing it uh, to try to get as much as possible. 
So now moving into um, creative and um, localization and personalization. Mm -hmm. So what are, what are your like um, insights about this? So how does play a role in reaching a big global market? Well, as I mentioned earlier, there's all these automated tools that platforms that are getting most of the spend, right? And, and these, these platforms where they're basically telling us is forget about all the ad tech. I provide you with the algorithm and the whole thing. Don't even worry about targeting. Just, just tell me what you want, okay? Mm -hmm. And all they want is us to focus on. I believe that's where the industry is moving. And I, I, I don't think it's necessarily bad. It's, it's actually makes sense. It's the biggest lever that we can actually pull, the creative. And I think that's what we actually should focus on. And uh, I've seen a lot of companies coming up. And to be honest, uh, when I've been running UA, the times that I had my biggest success was not because of an amazing inventory we found or amazing algorithm from an amazing partner. It was always tracking good creative would actually allow you to spend much more and actually have amazing KPI. So creative, we know, is the number one uh, thing. Mm -hmm. So I would say that in that regard, I see that marketing companies, especially gaming companies, we're doing our homework and everybody has understood this. Mm -hmm. And we have very complex uh, testing scenarios and the way that we, with all those concepts and iterations, variations of creatives that we actually do, I believe that that is great. And that's where it uh, takes, amount, takes a big chunk of amount of time of the UA managers. And I believe that's the right thing. Then into that, when we get into, okay, we understand this is so important, what are we gonna do? So I also mentioned the automation. So it makes sense that we can actually automate processes and we can actually pull those creative. So there's a lot of uh, interesting literature out there on how to test creatives effectively, especially on Facebook, which is one of the main drivers. And then we push those creatives to other channels. But uh, in Facebook, it's quite hard to, um, to actually put new creatives that would kill the old ones, no? because algorithms tend to and tend to give more value to the old existing old creatives, yeah. creatives. Yeah. So there's a lot of conversation around that and there are some certain techniques that you can do. And I would actually encourage anyone during listening to this podcast to go and look for those techniques because it's super important. And I would actually merge it with automation and ideal the scenario is that you actually just free some creatives, they are pushed and then they are automatically pushed into the campaigns and automatically we can know the results. And that whole thing is automated. And that's what we are trying to do actually in, in housing good game. That's one thing. And then the other thing when it gets really interesting, at least in DSP, when you have real control of your campaigns and you actually see the log double data, who are we serving this ad to yeah. per impression, then comes really interesting things that we can actually contextualize the creatives, personalize the creatives to the context where the user is actually seeing this ad, like with app, and we can actually put it exactly like it fits there, if it's a banner, for instance. And it's also really interesting that we can actually add tags to the creatives. Let's say we have a creative and we can put blue background, mood, you can put all kinds of tags, no, let's say five, six, seven tags. And then you can actually model those tags and understand, hey, look, I see that at 5 p.m. mood, the mood of, uh, I don't know, happy advertising in this kind, we see an outlier, we see something. And then it's how we can actually optimize. And I think that's what we're moving to and that's what we're actually trying to do. To enrich our creatives not just with the data but with more data and then mix that with the log level data with the post installed event data and then it's great because that's one of the main problems that we actually seen in dsps is that not many dsps have the creative part right and very few have them and that's extremely valuable and yeah so we also try to actually do it like that in fact we even have our own custom algorithm for creatives one of our DSPs because uh, we believe that is extremely important. Okay, so talking about the value, um, how do you evaluate the the success when you were running the campaigns and the partnership? Um, the campaigns we are performance, so we actually mm -hmm. run all the way to the very bottom of the funnel. Mm -hmm. We look at everything and it's raw. It's all. It's not all we care, but it, it's all about return on ad spend, and that's our main metric. Uh, obviously, when we optimize, we're, we're not just optimizing ROAS because that would be way too too down on the, the funnel. So we have to optimize on the upper funnel as well. So we look at IPMs and CPMs, and 
all these competitions and like mm -hmm. all these different events. And I believe that right now, one of the biggest fights that we have in the gaming is, uh, ecosystem is the IP impact. You know? uh, in the last three or four years, we've seen another kind of business model erupting inside the gaming industry, which is the hyper casual. And the way that these people work is that uh, they don't have such a high LTV like we mid core strategy games have. Mm -hmm. So historically, we've been competing in different environments. Okay, We've been competing in higher CPM. That was more for strategy. Uh, games or something like this, where we could actually afford 20 euro CPI, whereas a more casual or hyper casual title, hyper casual to be more concrete, they were they're running in the CPIs of less than one euro sometimes. So uh, what they did is that they actually the, the composition of the CPI is a mixture between the IPM and the CPM. So we were actually competing high CPM, so we were kind of like alone the strategy simulation title. But what happened is that the I, IPM that were able to compete on CPI basis with us in the same CPM ranges. And that was actually quite hard for us. That made us a life quite way, way harder because they increased the CPMs. And on top of that, the hyper casual titles, they monetize through ads. So it's not just that they increase our CPIs and they hurt us, it's that then we're actually serving our ads into their game. So they, they benefit twice from that. So uh, it's been quite hard for us, this whole IPM CPM thing. Uh, to be honest, and uh, that's been becoming more and more relevant. But that also ties to what we were talking before about creative effectiveness, that now we are actually doing our homework and we're actually increasing our IPN since we understand that creative is fundamental. And on top of that, also the changes in the device graph with the IDFA deputation could actually play good for us because uh, this, the, this hyper casual part of their success with the IPM CPN story that I just mentioned is that they are actually able, to, they have such a high volume that they're actually able to leverage a device graph partners, these um, IDFA partners way better than us. So I believe that now with the new changes in the ecosystem that we are seeing, uh, DSPs or gaming clients like us, we're in a favorable position actually. And at least it's how I want to picture things or be a bit more positive, optimistic towards the next uh, few months. Cool. Well, um, I guess I don't have any questions. Thank you, Paul, for joining us to discuss the strategies and your thoughts on the current trends in our industry. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in into the episode of Programmatic Connect Digital. And remember, stay safe and healthy, and let's do our part in beating this pandemic. Okay. Thanks a lot for inviting me, having me over, Archie and April, and looking forward to any questions from your uh, listeners, okay, in the future if you want to, okay? Thanks for tuning in on this episode of Programmatic Connect Digital. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to our channel for more exciting content.